My name is Trey Seals, and this is me becoming vocal. To start off, I think it's important for you all to know that I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason. So this entire presentation is essentially a snapshot of my entire life, how it led to the creation of vocal type and a little bit of what's next. So my journey began at the age of four. It started with a headache and the excessive blinking, and then the headaches became paralyzing. I had a brain tumor. I was born with it, and as I grew, it grew with me until it became about the size of a golf ball. Through that ordeal, drawing and writing really became my only means of coping with the pain. And when the tumor was gone, drawing and writing became my only means of really expressing what I was feeling as well. So I draw to my heart's content. And when I got tired of drawing, I'd practice writing in cursive until I could get my handwriting to look like the sample sheets. And four years later, just when I was becoming a real kid again, I was diagnosed with a residual brain tumor. And that's when everything really changed. I, I was different. Not like, I think we should see someone about this type of different, but more of a maturity type of different. Instead of drawing pictures of basketball players and skateboarders like I once did, I was drawing pictures of Venus de Milo, David, Greek columns, and a childhood I could never go back to. But beyond just drawing, a lot was also happening at the time. I experienced racism for the first time in the third grade. And then I started learning more about Black history, and which just made racism way more confusing. And all in all, I became more observant. I wanted to understand people more. And one of the things I started observing was my parents and how they ran their business. So from fifth through sixth grade, while I was supposed to be running the school store, I was convincing kids to have me gra graffiti their name on an index card for $3. And that experience made me realize that if I can make people happy by doing what makes me happy, then that's what I need to be doing for the rest of my life. So from middle school through college, really, I was designing tattoos, bee jewelry, t-shirts, resumes, books, legal jewelry, and anything I can, I can make up. But beyond just making and selling, I was also started working on a three year long personal project during my senior year of high school. I started drawing what would become the basis for my very first typeface. I didn't know anything about type design back then, but I knew one day, hopefully, I would be able to design it and release it for the entire world to see. And finally, in 2013, I, during my sophomore year of college, I unveiled Unveil. I still didn't know anything about type design back then, but I knew a lot about Illustrator. So it's basically just future wrapped in ribbons. <laughs> but the end result is a multi-layered vector font with five different styles that can be overlaid to create different compositions like this. And from time to time, I'd go back and update it with dingbats like the star at the bottom. But last I checked, it had been downloaded about 30,000 times or something around there. But I kind of stopped checking because I kept kicking myself and not charging as, at least 50 cents. But once the hype kind of died down, branding really became my passion. I rebranded, I did in as many logos and stationary projects as I could. I even rebranded the studio that I interned for back in 2014. And then when I graduated in 2015, I accepted a full-time position at a staffing agency with whom I had the opportunity to contract for about eight or nine different companies over the course of two years. I worked at agencies, studios, in-house, out-house, and everything between. Now, more importantly, I learned a lot about what kind of designer I wanted to be. And then, but then one day in March of 2016, I was working on another branding project, going through all the books in my library, going on every single design platform that there is out there, aimlessly scrolling through fonts, searching for inspiration. And I just got really bored. Everything I saw, no matter how beautiful, it all just kind of looked the same. 
And at first I kind of thought it was because of our obsession with grids and perfection. But the truth was there was no culture. There was no character. And while design is my passion, I started wondering if I had chosen the wrong career. But then one day, not long after, I came across this article from 1987, 1987 written by Dr. Shell D. Holmes Miller entitled Black Designers Missing in Action. And the article summarized that while most industries beyond design are white male dominated, if our job as the designers is to communicate an idea to black and brown communities, then black and brown communities need to have a seat at the table. But I take her thesis a step further, and I say the same thing for female communities, LGBTQ communities, indigenous communities, religious communities, and all my underrepresented, un underrepresented communities. Every, everyone needs to have a seat at the table, and the world is getting more and more diverse, and our industry really needs to catch up with it. But it wasn't until about a month or, so, a month or two later that I saw her sequel to the, to the 1987 article entitled Black Designers Still Missing in Action. And this version of the article was her way of really passing the torch to the next generation of Black designers. And it was because of this article that I began to think if our, part of our job is really to solve problems for our clients, then should we solve the ones facing our own industry before we can effectively solve those of our clients? And that's why I decided to find a way to diversify design. I knew I couldn't change demographics to the education system. So when I look back on my life, I thought about the days of working on my penmanship and design, graffitiing people's names on index cards for $3 and designing tattoos and creating Unveil. So making a font foundry just made sense to me. But at the same time, I had to ask myself two very important questions. Number one being, does the world really need another font foundry? And number two, if I start one, what can I do differently? So in thinking about diversity, I also like to think about my own racial experiences, like the first time I encountered racism in the workplace, or the time four cops stopped me while I was walking in Minneapolis, or the first time someone called me the N-word, and the first time I experienced racism. But I also like to think about my positive racial experiences, like the pride I felt the first time I learned about Dr. King and Eva Peron and Baird Rustin and Dolores Huerta and so many other black and brown his activists. And that's when I realized that type can be more than a tool for just design, but a tool for education and for sharing stories like the one that I'm telling you right now, because stories are really all that connect us. And that's how I came up with this, with this idea, to introduce a piece of minority culture to the root of all great pieces of graphic design, typography. The first typographic tale that I ever told was that of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Martin is what I like to call a nonviolent typeface inspired by remnants of the Memphis sanitation strike of 1968, during which time Memphis sanitation workers, the majority of them black, went out on strike demanding recognition of their union better wages, and a safer working condition after two trash handlers were killed by a malfunctioning garbage truck. As they marched, striking workers carried copies of a protest sign declaring, I am a man, which was a statement that recalled a question abolitionists posed more than 100 years earlier, am I not a man and a brother? It was the last cause Dr. King had the opportunity to fight for before his assassination that April. A few days later, his wife, Coretta Scott King, organized a march for people not only carried signs reading, I am a man and union justice now, but honor King and racism. Now, normally at this point in the talk, I would show some in-use in cases and talk about some of my other favorite projects and what inspired them and such. But instead, I feel kind of compelled to go into detail about the first image that you see when you go on the vocal types website. And it says diversifying design, preserving culture, and crafting typefaces. Using Martin as a case study for this, I'll start with crafting typefaces. First of all, Martin went through several updates before its release. The very first version was only, only based on the original signs consisting of only uppercase characters. 
But as I began to do research for other projects, I'd come across images with letter forms that felt really familiar. In this case, they're from newspaper headlines. And at first I didn't even realize what I had found until I, until I saw that uppercase S in the words, we shall overcome. So only from those words, I developed the entire lowercase alphabet and Arabic numerals. And then about a year or two later, I came across these two specimens. One of them was from a, Hamil from a Hamilton wood type catalog I had purchased and the other from American wood type manufacturing company. And it's pr pretty much the exact same design. And I realized, and part of me had wished that I had found these specimens earlier when I had first created Martin to help kind of guide my way. But then I realized that it would have diminished what makes Martin so special. It's the church it was printed in. It's the extra ink on the press, the poster board it was printed on, the people that carried it and the story behind it. It's what draws people in the story and the quirks, because there isn't that big a difference between what was going on in 1960 and what's going on in 2020, which brings me to renewing culture. And today, preserving and renewing culture is more important than ever. Following the police killings of those whose names I can't speak without tearing up, Martin has become a part of this movement, taking over the streets of New Jersey, being posted up in, throughout Bristol, on billboards in Tulsa, throughout storefronts, and throughout exhibitions, and crafted to, to create brand identities and social media campaigns. And I say all this to say that Martin wouldn't be Martin if I referenced these original specimens. It would have lost its boldness, its quirks, and its story. But beyond protests, I also must speak about the reason Martin and Vocal were even created in the first place, and that is to diversify design. While Helvetica and Futura and all the fonts created that were inspired by them are nice and really beautiful, I feel like European cultures can't and shouldn't speak for all cultures. However, one thing that I find to be really beautiful is when graphic designers use one of my fonts for projects that have absolutely nothing to do with the story behind them, like these spreads from Euroman magazine. Because the way in which the Swiss, German, and English cultures are seen and recognized throughout visual culture around the world, I want the same for all cultures. I want them to be recognized for their differences and seen as too important to appropriate. Because the only thing really separating appropriation from alliance is intent. And I want all communities to be more than just the target audience. Which brings me to this last project that I will show you. It is a work in progress. This typeface has no name. Its origins are unknown. And its references span space and time. I started noticing these images while doing research for other projects. And the ones you see here, are from the women's suffrage movement in the 19 teens. These are from the anti-Viet, anti, from the protests against the Vietnam War. And all of these are from the civil rights movement. And there are so many more. Some of them are from the Chicano rights movement. Some are from the LGBTQ movement. Some from the anti-apartheid movement. And the reason I'm showing you all of this not only because all these hand lettered signs look similar typographically, but they're all from different locations. Some are in the streets of New York, Philadelphia, DC, LA. Some are all the way in London from the anti-apartheid movement and others are in the suburbs of Memphis and Chicago. And while I'm nowhere close to finishing this project or figuring out what the real story is, this is just to give you a better idea of what happens when you start to overlay some of these characters. So while you may notice that each character looks similar to one another, to me, all I see is a testament to how we're more alike than we like to admit. And now, I know I've been talking about quite a bit, um, so thank you for allowing me to become vocal, but there's just one thing I need to leave you with before I go. And one, it's the one question I always get asked. And it's usually, how can I diversify design? 
And unfortunately, the short answer is no one can diversify design. No one person can diversify design because please understand that diversity is systemic and it will take generations before any large gains are seen. But inclusion is something we can all do today. All one needs to be inclusive is understanding. All you have to do is take interest in the lives of people who don't look like you, who aren't from where you're from, who don't speak the way you speak, who don't celebrate like you, who don't love the way you love. Just take a moment to understand. I hope you understand. Thank you.